Brendan pushing the record. Thank you, B-Man. Uh, today we continue in our study of the formula of Concord. Uh, we're opening the book of Concord and digging in. Right? Uh, and we're having absolutely no fun at all. It's been very boring. And obviously this document that was written in the 1500s has zero bearing on our life today. If you believe that, I've got some swampland in Arizona to sell you. In a bridge to Russia. Anybody want to buy? Yeah, I didn't think so. Alright, uh, let's pray and then we're going to dig in. We're going to approach this article, The Descent into Hell, slightly differently than we've approached other ones. Uh, so, bear, bear with me. Uh, let's pray and then we'll dig in. Uh, gracious Lord, you in your bodily resurrection assure us and give us the confidence to believe your promises throughout all of your word, for all of your word points to Christ. The fulfillment of your promise to crush the head of the serpent, to give us life eternal with you. And Lord, we look forward to the day when you return in glory to raise us from the dead and give us bodily resurrected life with you for eternity. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so some background knowledge would be helpful. Uh, in, the, in the early church, there was a lot of debate about things like uh, the layers of hell, uh, the, the, the place people go when they die. And, and there was a lot of, of uh, conversation and a lot of teaching that came simply out of a, a magisterial use of reason. Right? Did you, guys, you guys covered this with Pastor O'Donnell, didn't you? Right? A magisterial use of reason as opposed to a ministerial use of reason. Right? So when we put our thinking and our reasoning above Scripture and say things Scripture doesn't say, Scripture may allude to something and we extrapolate more than what it actually says and then teach that as the truth of Scripture, we are using our reason in a magisterial way. Right? That's a dangerous, slippery slope. So uh, how do we teach and talk about this article of the Apostles' Creed in which we say, he descended into hell? What, what, what's going on here? A little background. Again, in the early church and even amongst Lutherans in the 1500s, there was some debate about which layer of hell, which level of hell, which, in which manner did he descend? How did he descend? Was it just his humanity? Was it just his divinity? And they argued about this stuff, right? Uh, in, in the article that we'll read, uh, Luther says or rather the, the, the authors of the Formula of Concord, which are well after Luther died, right? They say Luther addressed this in a sermon in 1533, 50 years before the Formula of Concord. Luther addressed this in a sermon at Torgau, and the best thing you can do is go read that sermon and be done with it. <laughs> That's pretty German, right? <laughs> Right, German comedian, German stand-up comedians. You guys familiar with these guys? Nein. Now, why is the chicken across the road? So get to the other side. Thank you. I'll be here all the week. That's it. It's a German job. My skater who be in my German all the time. I'll be here all the week. I don't speak German either. Just, just what my grandpa taught me while I was listening, over eavesdropping on his phone calls to his brother Otto, who still lived in Germany. <laughs> Interestingly enough, his other brother graduated from the same university I graduated from here in America. I had no idea. I do now. Article 9 of the Formula of Concord addresses Christ's descent into hell. It, it attests that Christ went to proclaim that is to announce his victory over sin, death, and the devil. Not, not 
as part of his atonement for the sins of the world. That is, he didn't go to hell to suffer for you. It put an end to the squabbling that had arisen amongst Lutherans over the meaning of Christ's descent into hell. And it is based on the conclusions of one, one of Luther's sermons that discusses the issue. Okay? Uh, before we dig into this article, I want to read and give you a little, a little Greek lesson on the text. Did you catch that? The text that specifically teaches Christ's descent into hell. Why is it important to address the text that specifically addresses the issue at hand? Let me give you an example. Are you ready? Okay. Scripture teaches all kinds of things. And if you created a matrix with every book of the Bible across the top and down the side every chapter and verse and created a grid with a dot for every verse, do all of those dots connect? The answer is yes, eventually. Do all of them connect one to one? No. Do you want an example of this? This is, the, no, this is the most extreme example of this that I have. So I'm pushing the boundary a little bit. You ready? Yeah. The Bible says Judas went and hung himself. True? Okay. Jesus says, go and do thou likewise. <laughs> Is this true? Do, doesn't Jesus say that? The question at hand is, do those two verses go together? No, they don't. Right? So we need to use the verses that address the things we're actually talking about. If you want to talk about, for instance, what baptism does, you should look at the verses that actually talk about what baptism does. Not... The thief on the cross. The thief on the cross doesn't talk about baptism. None of that text talks about baptism. Don't use it in a baptismal argument. Fair? Okay. So if we're going to talk about Christ's descent into hell, we should probably address the text that deals with it. Can I have a reader? Dave, give us... 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the day of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which now corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Seems pretty basic, doesn't it? I spelled that wrong. Heck. Not that it makes a difference to you, it's all Greek to you, but it makes a difference in the C.I. and I. Heck. Heck. A. Rooks. I knew there was one of those in there. X A. Rooks. Okay. This word is the word for. Proclaim. Look at verse 19. 
in which he went and proclaimed. Ekruxen is the Greek. He went and ekruxen. What is this word not? Anybody got a different translation? First Peter chapter 3, verse 9. I'm sorry, what's it saying? Preached. Preached. Ooh. What, what, but when you hear preached, what do you think? What comes to mind? Evangelism. The good, he good news to them. Right? He went and good news to those spirits that were in prison. Ekruxin and euangelisto are very different words. Okay? You with me? Euangelisto or euangelion is that good news word. That's the where we get the word evangelism from. That's the proclamation of Christ who died and Christ who is risen and Christ who will come again. That's that whole good news of the gospel is euangelion. Okay? Is that what is that what the scripture says Jesus did to the spirits who were in prison? No. It says at Ruxin, he proclaimed. Um, this is more along the lines of not good newsing someone, but declaring an edict. Okay? So this is how I teach this to the confirmation kids. We'll get more serious after this. You ready? Jesus goes to hell to go, <laughs> I win! <laughs> the whole point is Jesus goes into the realms of those who are evil and captive and says to them, you think in my death you gained something. You have gained nothing. In fact, what you've, what you've unwittingly complied with and participated in is my victory. You could say Jesus takes a victory lap. <laughs> He doesn't claim hell. He, he, claimed the victory. he proclaimed the victory. Yeah, He's announcing my victory is done. What did he say on the cross? Yes. It's mostly done. I just got to go suffer in hell a little bit and then it'll be done. And now what he said? No. He said it is finished. finished. Christ suffered all of the wrath of God against sin on the cross. Christ suffered hell for you on the cross. This verse from 1 Peter, the verse that specifically addresses Christ's descent into hell, in one word, demonstrates... Jesus isn't going there to finish something. He's going there to declare what is already done. Okay? Again, in the early church and even in the 16th century among the Lutherans, there was some argument. Well, did he, did he go in his humanity or did he go in his divinity? Go back to the article we talked about, the person of Christ. Can you separate his divinity and his humanity? No. But what does the text actually tell us? Let's look at the end of verse 18. But being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Where's his body? In the grave. What happens at death to our created nature? We're created body and soul knit together. And that's what we're meant to be for eternity. So what happens at death? Separated. Body and soul are temporarily rent asunder. 
I like that word, rent asunder. Right? It makes it more like visceral. Right? What happens when Christ returns in the resurrection of the dead? Bodies and souls get put back together, and that's eternal life. A physical, bodily, resurrected, eternal life in the presence of a physical, bodily, resurrected Jesus. If you were listening at 8 o'clock, you know what I'm talking about. Huh? It's important. Jesus, being fully man, when he dies, <clears throat> when he rises, is the firstborn among the dead. Does this text from 1 Peter get into the details of how all that happened? No. Okay, Pastor, what are you teaching us? Let's read the article, shall we? The status of the controversy... The chief controversy about this article of the descent into hell. Uh, Alec, can I put you on reading? Thank you, sir. How hard will it be? Oh, just go. <laughs> <laughs> this article has also been disputed among some theologians who have subscribed to the Augsburg Confession. When and in the, what manner did the, Lord, did the Lord Christ, according to our simple Christian faith, descend to hell. Was this done before or after his death? Did this happen only to his soul, only to the divinity, or with body and soul, spiritually or bodily? Does this article belong to Christ's passion or to his glorious victory and triumph? In this article, like the preceding article, cannot be grasped, grasped, grasped by the sense or by our reason. It must be grasped, grasped through <laughs> faith alone. Therefore, it is our unanimous opinion that there should be no dispute over it. It should be believed and taught only by the simplest way. Teach it like Dr. Luther of blessed memory in his sermon at Torgau in the year 1533. He has explained this article in a completely Christian way. He separated all useless and unnecessary questions from it and encouraged our godly Christians to believe with Christian simplicity. It is enough if we know that Christ ascended into hell, destroyed hell for all believers, and delivered them from the power of death of the devil and of the devil, from eternal condemnation and the jaws of hell, we will save our questions and not curiously investigate about how this happened until the other world. Then not only this mystery, but others also will be revealed that we simply believe, hear, and cannot grasp with our blind reason. Thank you. Uh, if you're interested, the Torgau Sermon, it is online. Uh, I've cited it in your notes uh, on, on, the, on page two, right? I, I've cited where you can find it. Uh, it is printed in this fashion, seven pages. And y'all think we preach long <laughs> Okay? It is printed in this fashion, seven pages. My sermons are typically three, maybe four. Okay? In 14 point font, space and a half, around a thousand words, I max out at like 1400. Okay? <laughs> printed. Whether that's what comes out of my face, right? Print it. That's where my sermons max out. Okay? This is 12 point font, single spaced, two columns. I did not count the words. I should count the words. Maybe next week I'll have a word count for you on this sermon. Ah, no. <laughs> Y'all would revolt. 
if we read this as a sermon. So, instead of reading the whole sermon, if you're interested, right, not only is it for you, but I printed a couple extra copies. For the sake of our brief time together, I gave you some excerpts from this sermon that is cited in Article 9 of the Descent into Hell, where we are encouraged to believe and to teach this article the way Luther did in his Torgau sermon of 1533. Too bad Will isn't here. I would have had him future Pastor Lennington read for us this, <laughs> these excerpts of this sermon. Steve. Was this just for this article, or was Luther other aspects that, hey, don't, because it seems like this could be, you could talk about the Trinity, I mean, there's so many different things you could apply this to and say, you don't know, I mean, what, when do you know when to really dig in deeper and when to take the text at its plain meaning and yeah. just run with it? Yeah. That's what we should do all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they were also teaching these things, right? I mean, it wasn't, right? It, it, Pat, Pat's right that these were theologians. These were scholars who were sitting around debating these things. But it, but it wasn't just Lutheran theologians and scholars. There were, there were generations of men before them who very publicly had taught in, in sermons, in universities, in, in, in communities, different things about Christ's descent into hell. No, I mean, just for, for a moment, I don't want you to linger here. For a moment, um, put in place a discussion about purgatory or limbo or any of the other <coughs> understandings of how the spiritual world slash afterlife work that you've ever heard from history. Okay? and then drop this article into the midst, letting those understandings reign over how we teach this. Confusing? Yes. Abundantly. Yes, Paul, you're chomping at the bit. Thank you for using a microphone so we can all hear you. <coughs> Big sigh. See, because I made a smart aleck comment to George, imagine that, that somehow I was, I was going to bring the thief on the cross into this today. But isn't this where the thief on the cross comes into play? Today, I will, you will be with me in heaven. Again, there is no, no, no purgatory. First, first, hang on. First, he says paradise. Not paradise. Paradise, thank you. Second, what is that text about? Forgiveness. The abundant grace of God. <laughs> is that text about Christ's descent into hell? No. no. Is that text about baptism? No. Is that text about eternal life? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that text about the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come? Careful. <laughs> sure, it is. Yeah, I, yeah, I'll give you that one. Is it? It's. it's you will be with me in paradise. Uh-huh. That's all he says. He doesn't define it in any way. He doesn't go on to explain it in any way. It's simply a declaration of grace in the face of repentance. And then we read more into it because we say we're going to be joined bodily. Right. And then we go nuts because we take human reason and wisdom and understanding and we set it right on top of Scripture and go, well, that's what Jesus was talking about. Pump the brakes, folks. Yes, Pam. There's Jeff. Yep. Oh, oh, yeah, Chris is on it. Historically, during this time in the 15 and prior to that, sure. with all the theologians sitting around trying to discuss yeah. Yeah, yeah. how they interpreted things, uh, the church was very um, useful in using purgatory. Ooh. Yeah, why you should point. help contribute to this right. cathedral. Right. Why we, right. Because yeah. the people were illiterate. Well, and some were. Well, a, a vast yeah. portion well, of them well, I, I think friends. I think the better argument there, Pam, historically, is that the scriptures weren't available in any. languages people could read. It it's not that people couldn't read. Okay? They just didn't have the scriptures in languages they could read. Right. But it was it was easy to confuse and... You could teach whatever you wanted, and they were taught to trust their preachers. Yes. Or okay. be excommunicated. No. No. 
There's some truth to that. So can we get can we get to Luther's sermon? Sure. Let's let's get to Luther's sermon. Paul, <laughs> since you uh, played the smart aleck, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna encourage you to now yeah all right now now hear this, folks. Uh, in case you didn't know. Luther was always pious and humble and kind in the way that he talked. He was, he was never snarky or sarcastic at all. Just like me. Okay? So, a little bit. So, recognize, recognize by the way, uh, in the midst of this, in the midst of preparing for this, I read an article about why teams that run with a te teams, like leadership teams that run with just a little bit of sarcasm in their interaction with each other, are actually more creative and more thoughtful. Because sarcasm requires you to think on a different level. It requires you to not simply hear and react to literally what's said. It requires you to think and process and be imaginative, right? So team, this article was, was promoting teams that run with a little bit of sarcasm actually are more creative. I didn't mind that. <laughs> Paul, excerpts from Luther's sermon at Torgau, Torgau, cited in the Formula of Concord, the Epitome, Article 9. Please, would you read for us? For even though one would wish to suffer his own strong and to detailed... To offer. To offer. Yep. I, yeah, apparently I do. I'm Keep sorry. going. Let's try again. For even though one would wish to offer his own strong and detailed opinion about it, <coughs> even as some teachers have debated whether he personally and actually descended according to the soul, or only through his might and power, it is nevertheless not something to be grasped or fathomed with our thoughts, and not even these teachers themselves have understood it. For the idea that I should explain with words or grasp with the five senses how something that is very far above and beyond this life actually occurs, I will gladly leave it alone. Indeed, if I cannot grasp all that pertains to this life, for example, what Christ experienced in the garden in mind and spirit when he sweat blood, but must let it remain a matter of word and faith, then much less will I be able to grasp with words or thoughts how he descended into hell. But since we must indeed picture for ourselves that which the words depict for us, being unable to consider or understand any of it without such pictures, therefore it is good and right that one should, according to the word, Consider the matter just as it is often depicted, <coughs> that Christ ascended with his banner to break open and destroy the gates of hell, and we should leave the high and incomprehensible thoughts behind. Okay, pause for a second. Part of the debate going on in Luther's day and even before him was, what kind of banner did he carry? <laughs> how is this banner and, and able to withstand hell? How could it not? How could it be there and not be burnt? <laughs> Folks, this is the silliness of the things they were debating, Paul. Yeah, and we have that beautiful picture of the lamb. The lamb with the banner, right? Well, what kind of banner is that? What's that pole made of? How's it gonna how's it gonna withstand the brimstone and the fire of hell? Come on now. Yes, Paul, please. And surely this is also what has come down to us from the ancient fathers as they spoke and sang about this article. As even now the old hymns ring out and we sing on Easter Day. He who shattered hell and bound the rotten devil therein, etc. Did he really say etc.? Yep. <laughs> For when a child or a simple person hears such things, he thinks of nothing else but that Christ has defeated the devil and taken all his power away from him. That is proper Christian thinking. It gets at the truth and the meaning of this article, even though it is not a precise manner of speaking and does not spell out how it happened. There you go. It does, it, the scriptures do not spell out how it happened. Luther then goes on to, in this sermon, to mock the attempts to debate the fruitless questions with his typical sarcasm. 
Human minds benefit from an image, so we have an image of the descent into hell, but this image, this image should not be taken too literally. Luther says, Christ goes to hell to plant a victory flag, but we should not worry about the banner, whether it was made of paper or, or silk or some other material, right? How it would not burn in hell, rather, Luther advocates stick to the practical use of the question. Christ has destroyed hell and robbed the devil of his power. Period. This whole article about Christ descended into hell, this one line of the Apostles' Creed, he descended into hell. We understand it simply by what it says. Christ proclaimed as an edict his victory over death and the devil end of story it, it, is, is that what 1 Peter 3 says that's what Ephesians 4 says is Ephesians 4 talking about his descent into hell Good question. Well, let's go look. Ephesians chapter 4. You got Bibles. Let's go there. chapter 4. We'll start right at the beginning. There's a reason I give you some context here in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 is talking about the suffering of Christ for the sin of mankind. He's talking about how he accomplished victory over death and the devil. Ephesians 4. What is Ephesians 4 talking about in its context? Okay, that's the bold heading, right? So maybe we should just read the text and let the text tell us what the text is talking about. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for work of ministry. Uh, I don't love that translation of that verse. Uh, for the building up of the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined together by every joint, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up. What part of that talks about Christ's descent into hell? As he descends to the earth, or that he from heaven to the earth. Okay. 
he descended. Let's, let's look at Psalm 68. Psalm 68, right? We're supposed to let the clearer passages of Scripture help us understand the less clear passages of Scripture. Psalm 68, verse 18. What do you get there? Ascended on high, leading a host of captains in your train, and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Where, where is he leading these captives out of? Talking about leading, leading the captives who are captive to sin. Jim, spiritual death. He's leading us out of spiritual death. That's all of us. All of us that live on the face of this earth, for it is appointed for man to live once, and then comes the judgment. Again, let's let the clearer passages help us understand the less clear passages. <coughs> Does Psalm 68 or Ephesians 4 or 1 Peter 3 in any way give us the hint that, well, there's some people that didn't listen to God while they were living, and then after they died, bef before Christ really came, because, you know, can't really be judged until after Christ accomplishes his work. Is there, is there any room to say, oh wait, these people, they're a special kind of people, they get a second chance. The leading the captives free isn't about leading souls that are bound in hell out. It's about leading us, who are in spiritual captivity, enslaved to sin, into the gospel, into the kingdom of grace. That is, marvelously, in his transferring us out of the kingdom of darkness and into his marvelous light. Right? But again, Ryan, this is one of those texts that the early church fathers, that the, that the historians of, or the theologians of history used to make these arguments about the, the different levels of hell and what Christ was really doing there. And was he pro, well, he was proclaiming the gospel to some, and he was leading them out because and setting them free. Now, hang on. It's appointed for man to live once, and then comes judgment. So... Does Ephesians 4 really talk about Christ proclaiming in hell his victory and leading the captives out of hell in his victory? Is that, is that what Ephesians 4 talks about? I don't think so. I think it talks about the gospel being proclaimed and leading us out of the kingdom of darkness and into his marvelous light bringing us out of the division and the dissension of human nature and into the unity of the body of Christ. Do you see that in context? Again, think of the matrix. Think of the, the chart with all the dots of all the verses and the, which ones do you connect? Dan? Uh, did some of the dispute come out because of the word prison? Because the apostles of Jesus know how to say hell and they say hell, Hades. 
And prison means a place where people are guarded? Uh, uh, again, uh, a lot of this debate historically comes in um, preconceived notions about how the afterlife works. Right? With, with, with which we don't know. Old Testament talks about Sheol being a resting place of the dead. In fact, the Old Testament uses Sheol in like three very distinctly different ways. One of them is eternal death. One, one of them is not. Actually, two of them are not. But one of them is. So, yes, historians and theologians of the, uh, well, I should say theologians of history made a big deal about these Distinctions. I didn't find any other word, use of the word prison that was equated with that moment. Right. Because prison is where John the Baptist was. Prison is where yeah. other Paul things. Where Paul was, Paul was, where was Peter was. was. Right. Not, was not, right. Maybe I just read the but, but it also doesn't ever talk about descending into prison. Yeah. Right. right? So, again, this is one text. It doesn't say descent. He went and pro he was put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit, in which, in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed. And there's no like uh, prophecy in the Old Testament that we would look to that would interpret this, or this is like the only place where we're this is it. So that's. I always wonder why it's in the Apostles' Creed now. See, and why do we just take it out? So, is it, you don't really need to believe it. I mean, you need to believe it, but it's not like... like there's, it's just, there's comfort in believing it, right? There's comfort in believing that Christ has planted his victory flag in hell, and it no longer has dominion over him or me united to him. I have been led, led out... The, I who was captive have been um, led in that host of captives to whom he gave gifts. There's comfort in that. Right? But whom do we serve by trying to dissect this? Nobody. Do we serve the unity of the body? No. So what does Luther say? This is how it is. This is what happened. Everybody else stop. You got no leg to stand on other than to proclaim this is what happened. Yes, Pat? It's not. It's having a little side talk. You were having a side yeah. conversation. And I was asking him, when does, hey, hey, when, <laughs> when does purgatory enter the Roman Catholic theology and mm. practice? Mm. And um, we agreed that probably when the Pope needed money, mm -hmm. to a greater degree than most things, because when you look at the old the creeds, they all precede that. And we're pro we're proclaiming them in our worship yep. even today. Yes. So here's man in the middle. Yep. Um, in fact, if you, if you get a book of Concord, right? If you get a book of Concord that has all of the confessional writings of the Lutheran Church, the first three writings of the confessions of the Lutheran Church are the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. We confess the same faith that's been confessed throughout the history of the church. Now, the rest of the, the Book of Concord, the Augsburg Confession, the Apology, the Augsburg Confession, the Treatise on the Power and the Primacy of the Pope, the Small Catechism, the Large Catechism, the Small Called Articles, the Formula of Concord, Epitome, and the Formula of Concord is the Declaration. All of them build on confessing the same things that the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed confess. All of them. In other words, we're not saying anything new. And in fact, we're limiting ourselves to say what Scripture says. This is one of those moments with the descent into hell, 
that we really need to just limit ourselves to say what Scripture says. Question one on page two. Look at that. I got to our study questions. <laughs> what is the danger? What is the danger of going beyond the text of the Word of God to explain this statement of the creed? Dave, you want to put the mic up and say that? I think we just spent the last 45 minutes answering this very question. Now, what happens? You start putting man's words in the Bible. You start putting our interpretation in front of the comfort of the gospel. You start finding yourself in territory where you don't have a defense for what you're arguing outside of a bunch of dudes. And, and what is the end result when you don't have the word of God as the foundation of your faith? Your faith becomes whatever you declare it to be. And then, what happens to the God you actually believe in? Do that again, Carrie. <laughs> My favorite moment in all of the Marvel movies, yes, is when Hulk grabs Loki by the ankle and slams him to and fro, and as he begins to walk away, he goes, Puny God. I think I should have that drink now. Puny God. Right? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Paul. I'm with you. Uh, right? Pu you, when you do that, the God you believe in becomes a God that you can fit into your 3.2 pound human brain. Right here, if anybody takes away from the I'll tell you what now, folks. Love you with all my heart in Jesus. If your God fits into your 3.2 pound human brain, he's not worth worshiping. It's an awfully small God, puny God. Right? Just, just the same way I told you in the final victory workshop, if what you're clinging to for comfort in the face of death doesn't point you directly to Christ, try it. Pass all hand. Yes, Carol. Nope. Let's switch on the very bottom. I know a lot of times you'll hear people talking about when someone dies. Yep. Um, we need to give them the proper burial. We need to do this. We need to do that. If we don't do it just right, they're not going to make it to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> That's basically what you hear. Yep. And, and that includes the body. I mean, there's, we've got stuff going over in Israel right now with the bombing and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And there's bodies that are going to come back mm -hmm. that are destroyed. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you answer people like that? Uh, the, <laughs> you, do you want the do you want the in the moment caring pastoral answer, or do you want the slightly snarky a year later answer? Oh, the second is always the second is always a good place to start. The 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 slightly snarky a year later answer is oh right, like anything you do can actually guarantee that person a spot in heaven. No, that's the work of God in Christ that delivers you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. That's what Christ accomplished on the cross when he said, it is finished. The promise of resurrection and life in Christ is that very promise. The promise of what God provides for us without any merit or worthiness in me. Right? So... How do I just how do I talk about it in the moment? Right? I, if there are if there are if there are things that point us to Jesus and His work accomplished for us, then I would love to help us focus on those. When it when it comes to all the details of burial, there are things we can do that will confess Christ is raised for us. There are things we can do that will con that can confess something else. My question is, where do we want to put our trust? In the things we do for this person who has died, or in the things Christ has done for them and for us? Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I've heard people say, you know, I, I, well, I'll say it myself. 
I don't want this body when I rise again. You won't have that body when you rise again. You'll have that body perfected and glorified. He will. What? And, okay, so where do we go? Plain scripture, clear text. He will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. We'll have glorious bodies, which means, Carol, it doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter how old our resurrected body is going to be. It's going to be a glorious body. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to a pancreas that works, and a thyroid that works, and a gallbladder that works, and an appendix that works. You want me to just keep going? Yeah, most of the time, a brain that works, that'd be great. Right? A brain that can focus on like one thing for any length of time. That'd be great. I don't have that. I'm trying, but I just don't have that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Danger Will Robinson, when we move beyond the text of Scripture, and start describing our faith or describing what Christ has given us. Question two, what role must human reason and curiosity take in this teaching? Backseat. Back seat. Ministerial use. In service to the text, not over the text. You can make scripture say anything you want. Let me say that again. You can make Scripture say anything you want. If you use the dots in the matrix and connect the right text together, you can make Scripture say anything you want. Okay? But is that what Scripture says? And that's the difference between ministerial use and magisterial use of reason. What does the Scripture actually say versus what we want it to say? So, human reason must take a servant role, a back seat, if you will. Question three, how best do we understand this confession of the faith, the descent into hell? How best do we understand that Jesus descended into hell? As scripture says, he went to proclaim his victory. Everybody got it? See, this one's really easy. <laughs> Michael, here comes the torpedo. <laughs> I think the ball natural dogs is sir servant and everything he said that the culture believes about the trample and grave Jerusalem and that is true of oh, Jesus descending to hell. You want there to proclaim this victory? Yeah. 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 You, you could link the triumphal entry into Jerusalem and his descent into hell. He rides into Jerusalem in a celebration of victory that has already occurred. And you receive it by faith. By faith, not by understanding. By faith. Are we okay there? Okay. Again, uh, the Torgau sermon is linked in your Bible study notes. If you've got like a half an hour to kill, I encourage you to read it. It's it's good. And then and then when you, once you read it, come tell me how long my sermons are. <laughs> Okay, let's pray, and then we can be done. Right? Uh, I don't think so. He talked. He talked in German, right? You can't sp say anything in German quickly. <laughs> we pray, Almighty and Eternal God. According to your righteous judgment, you condemn the unbelieving world through the flood. In your great mercy, you preserved believing Noah and his family. You drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh with all his hosts in the Red Sea and led your people Israel through the same on dry ground. By these events, you prefigured this bath of, our, of your baptism. And through the baptism of your dear child, our Lord Jesus Christ, you consecrated and set apart 
the Jordan, and all water as a salutary blood and a rich and full washing away of sin. We pray through Christ for your boundless mercy that you will graciously behold us and bless us with true faith in the Spirit. Then by means of his, this saving flood, that is our baptism, all that has been born in us from Adam and which we ourselves have added thereto may be drowned in us and engulfed. May we be separated from the number of unbelieving, preserved, dry, and secure in the holy ark of Christendom, and serve your name at all times, fervent in spirit and joyful in hope with all believers. May we be made worthy to attain eternal life according to your promise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Next week...